Ted, good afternoon. It's wonderful to be interviewing you today. Could you tell us a little bit about your site, Active Mysticism? It was done before I had ever heard of Tom Campbell, and it was done to represent my lifetime of exploration and the things that I found significant that I had reacted to and sort of saw value in. And um, it stretches from when I was in college um, through, well, through the rest of my life as I was reading various things. Um, and basically, I would say that I, I could see that there were all of these different things and they all really fitted together and provided a, a, a picture, an understanding that we, well, we don't have the objective reality of science and that there are many ways of looking at it. Um, I mean, there are poems that I wrote which I didn't, it's difficult to say that I wrote, wrote them because they would be like I'd be riding along on my motorcycle and I would have one come into my mind when I was not, you know, I wasn't planning on figuring something like that out. And it might come one line at a time. And I would remember it until I would be stopped and could write it down. Or it might be some other situation. And uh, when I was putting my website together, I realized that it sort of, they fitted together as a group. And that's, well, that's why I put those there. There were others that were left out. I had re read Neil Donald Walsh, his books on conversation with God and some of the later ones. And that's, that's when I tried doing a little of, of um, what do they call it, uh, automatic writing. And that's basically how that website was put together. I would not necessarily, well, some pages were planned. I figured them out. But like the last, when I put a, a short uh, model of reality together, I didn't really put it together as I started typing and I would type out of most of a page or all of a page and then I would do another page and then I would do another page and then I would go back and maybe add something and then I would figure out what order they had to go in um, but it wasn't planned on my part um, and then when I ran into Tom's website and ordered the books um, after I read the books actually I think I'd read them more than once at the time and I'd also spent a lot sent a lot of emails back and forth with Tom asking questions getting answers and kind of getting a better understanding. Uh, I redid that, the last section based on revisions after, after my big toe. I think it's interesting for you as a mystic that you found such a resonance with Tom Campbell's My Big Toe in that here was a, a physicist and you're approaching it from a completely different viewpoint and yet this helped to complete and fill in some mm -hmm. of your uh, theory, your theory of reality and your theory of God and when we say, or when I say God, or probably, and you as well, you mean it in the larger sense, not, yeah. a, not a, a particular religious viewpoint of God. Um, what is very interesting to me is how you decided to add detail to your work 
that is from your particular viewpoint to Tom's work and how that resonated and how it shed light on the fact that Tom derived, his big toe derived quantum mechanics and relativity and you found a common ground in that. Can you, can you expand on that? One of the things that I've mentioned in there is, um, is Carlos Castaneda. And Carlos Castaneda, depending on who you talk to, has got maybe a bad reputation. And maybe some people didn't think much of it or didn't believe it, um, thought he made it up and so forth. And it's conceivable that he had made it up, but I don't really think that it's too likely. I don't think he was that good. I think he could not have made it all up out of his own head. Uh, and that he was very likely in contact with a long-going tradition of Nahuals, or however they say it. Um, and this viewpoint on our reality. But they had, as part of that viewpoint, they stopped at a point. I mean, they talked about uh, going into what would have ob obviously had to be a non-physical reality, but they also talked about their concept of what was there was the eagle. But one of his books was The Eagle's Gift. And I, I, I'd have to go back and find my notes because I don't have, frankly, a perfectly clear memory of what I experienced. But at one point I did have an experience of seeing that eagle or whatever led them to think of it. Um, but their concept was that when we died, we went to somewhere, we passed through an aperture, and he described two apertures, one out of which came the eagle's emanations, which created our reality, and the other by which we went back and we became the eagle's food. Well, to me, that was a perfect parallel to our virtual reality be cre being created over this data stream coming to us from the, you know, from the big computer. And the return, it would have to be symbolic entirely because we're not the eagle's food, but at the same time, that's pretty much analogous considering who they were and their viewpoints to our function as reducing the entropy of ourselves and of the whole system by our passage through these virtual realities. Uh, so, I mean, it, if as long as you don't mind the metaphors being stretched a good bit, it was a perfect fit. And it, it also matched up with uh, Robert Monroe. Um, he talked about two apertures again, two, you know, a place where everything was created out of and a place where everything returned. And uh, again, it was a very good analogy. And uh, to me, it made a, you know, here's the guy who's figured out how to step through that curtain and describe what is beyond. And I, because of my history of uh, what I had done in graduate school in terms of computer programming and uh, modeling of physical systems and so forth. Um, and also I had had a contact uh, going back uh, when they were 
originally, I think, the first I saw this article in Scientific American um, about cellular automatons. And that, you know, that and the computer programming and the stepping of time through and modeling changes, all of that just fitted right in with saying, hey, he's really talking about the way it could work. I can see that it could work that way. I, I get it. Now, I, I don't really know, how, I don't have a good feeling for how many people do get that. A lot of them don't apparently and pass that over. But um, what I've been doing with the new wiki is that I've been putting that together, knowing that Tom will come along and he will add his part to it and so forth. But we had just, before we started putting the wiki together, um, sent some emails back and forth where it had, I, had, I had written a sort of a half of a chapter in which I described um, how, how things would develop, how things could be considered to develop, um, making references to cellular automatons and other aspects of pure mathematics that go into explaining and making it clear basically it's almost like things had to go in the reality that Tom speculated about. It had to move to consciousness. It was programmed in, not in the sense that it is, uh, you know, directed, deterministic. It was all, it all came out of arbitrariness, randomness. But by the nature of our reality, which we can observe in pure mathematics, uh, which includes cellular automatons and topology and a whole bunch of things that don't come to mind at the moment, um, it just falls out that way. Uh, our reality is built to become conscious and to house consciousness, to host it. Um, and um, the things that happen in complex systems, uh, what they refer to as emergent complexity, uh, automatically we get the structure that would lead us to what becomes AUO, Absolute Unbounded Oneness. It, it's going to happen. Uh, I mean, it, it took a long time. There were a lot of false paths, a lot of uh, backup and re redirect, change directions, because as Tom has always said, it's part of this, I'm, I'm looking for the word evolution, evolution. It is part of evolution in the broader sense that Tom considers it, that all of these things are, the, the, they just fit together. It's going to happen. Uh, it's like the joke about the, you know, the million monkeys typing out Shakespeare. It leads from the randomness automatically through a development into a, what I called proto-IUOCs, and which Tom didn't really mention, he referred to it as dividing. And yes, he's right, it is a matter of dividing what was the oneness. But these were 
inherently generated in the processes that uh, pure mathematics discovers in, um, well, things like the internet, or economies, or ecologies. Um, I'm probably not remembering all of the examples that I had in, in that chapter. Um, I sent it to, to Tom and he sent it on to some other people. It all just fits together and basically it's like it had to happen this way except it didn't. You know, it, it took an awful lot of trial and error and it eventually it, it automatically leads to this AUO which isn't really thinking doesn't really have consciousness yet, but we're, we're automatically setting up these islands of digital stability that communicate over something that becomes the reality wide web. And as they send their messages back and forth, they automatically, eventually, some of them develop pattern matching and pattern matching of patterns and it just gets more and more complex and more and more integrated and we still have to go to Tom's metaphor of the bootstrapping because no one has ever done this in a PMR computer as yet. They're, they're thinking about it but they haven't done it yet and how long it'll be we don't know. But we know that it has a lot to do with pattern matching. When you say pattern matching and this basic primitive evolution, are you speaking of the fractal nature of things? Well, that's, that's part of it. But um, the, the fractals and all of these other things, there's a pattern that gets followed in reality, in, in consciousness space, where they get a great deal of mileage, complexity, building and building and building on building on top of building on top of things from taking a simple rule set and repeating it. And that's basically what fractals are. So the fractal nature of reality is just another pattern of using this same concept of a simple set, a simple rule set. That's, that's, that's where you start this cellular automaton working. The, the, the digital aspects of reality that everything else genera generates from. This is the power that, that moves it. It has a lot of features, characteristics that we observe in science and mathematics and technology in our physical world here, which we can then go back and say, yes, this would probably happen because a cellular automaton is going to do this and it's going to naturally lead to this and if you've got a vast field you are going to end up with stable areas and those stable areas are going to be separated by unstable areas and data but the thing is by doing this if you've got all of these areas if all you've got is one vast connected area uh, if you try to send data from here to way over there, it's going to hit something. But if you create this pattern, and you can visualize it by saying, look, think of a giraffe's hide. If you've got all of these patches and all of this channel running between it, and if the channels running between are designed to transfer data, that does not run into itself and crash and burn, 
but can follow on until it reaches its planned destination, we can go from something which is wide open, but you can't get from here to there because you're going to run into something, to something that it doesn't matter how far it is or how complex the path is, you can get to it because it will follow, it will follow the available path. As an engineer, I had, over all of the years, come to think of myself as doing a lot of work based on principles. I would get into something uh, that somebody had just fouled up totally. Pieces didn't fit together. The output of this didn't match the input of that, and so on down the line and it didn't do the job. And what I would tend to do would be to figure out how to tweak this and adjust that and so forth, make the output match the input and so on and so forth, and basically save customers a lot of money because rather than saying rip it all out and I'll sell you a new one, I could very frequently say, well, let's, let's modify this and adjust that and it, make it work. And that's due to your insight and your intuition into the larger reality. reality. Well, I don't, I don't know where it comes from, but <laughs> I mean, I, it's, it's characteristic of me that I look at it that yeah. way. Because Tom and, often says that he has solved difficult physic, physics problems um, using uh, his ability to tap into the larger reality. And this, I think, is what a lot of people don't understand about this big theory, that it is helpful, you as a PhD in engineering, this is helpful to people in any walk of life, engineer, physicist, even your viewpoint as a mystic, as an artist, a musician, mm -hmm. anyone can use this theory, this is its huge value and this is where um, the connection to um, this is where the connection quantum mechanics and relativity have been bridged together and this is where you can um, really see that would you well, comment on that I, I would not claim that I do that um, I know that Tom does, and he's described it. Um, I may be getting information from somewhat the same area, but it is not a conscious process with me. I wouldn't begin to claim that I can do what Tom does there. Uh, but what I was heading for is that one of the things that I had sort of developed as a principle, if I go out on a job, an engineering job, to look at a problem is that I the, the parts have got to fit they they've got to match together and what I would be looking for is where they don't and how to make them do so and that is the thing with Tom's big toe that all of the pieces do fit together it fits together with mathematics that people come up with for whatever reason they come up with it, whether it's pure mathematics and they're doing it because it gets some tenure and keeps them getting paid, or they do it for the pure pleasure of it, which is probably an element of it too, because otherwise who the hell wants to be a PhD? Uh, it's, not, it's not an easy row. To hoe. Um, but uh, that's the big thing uh, about Tom's theory is that all of those pieces fit together and the more I have found out about it and you know maybe extended something a little bit here and there and so forth uh, it, it 
it always fits together and I can go back to Tom and I can say, so, look, you know, what about so-and-so and so, and so? And he, yeah, he says, yeah, that, it, here it is and I explained this and so forth. I didn't say those words, but I, this is the kind of thing that I meant when I said evolution, I wasn't talking about just slimy stuff growing in the pond. I was talking about um, you know, all of these aspects of uh, mathematics and so forth. So, you know, I have not reached the end of where he has not gotten it. It, it, it is inherent in what he did. He may have stopped at an elementary level, but all of the rest is inherent in there. You have read Tom's books. I think you were one of the first readers of Tom's My Big Toe back in 2003. Um, you have said that MBT rapidly expanded your understanding of reality as, as, you've, as you've told us. Could you give us a, a particular example of what parts of his big toe uh, rapidly expanded your understanding of the larger reality from your own viewpoint, either from the standpoint of a PhD in engineering or from the standpoint um, from a mystic standpoint? Well, I, I had already mentioned some when I was talking about the, the things that particularly struck me uh, I mentioned was that Carlos Castaneda's reality of the the two apertures and Robert Monroe's had some kind of the same kind of thing where our reality is generated from one something coming from one aperture and we leave this air this realm by the other aperture uh, they were they were stuck on this side of the curtain and Tom's uh, reality and the, the reality wide web, it, it just, you know, there it is, exactly. Exactly what they're talking about and he's got the side behind the curtain. Have you delved into, you are an explorer of the larger reality because of your natural talents and your understanding. What other aspects of the larger reality have proved to be helpful to you? Have you delved into past lives um, or future or have you have, do you have premonitions of things? And I know all of this fits into Tom's theory, big theory of everything. Have any of these particular aspects of the larger reality been, been helpful to you? Uh, well, they have existed. I don't know about saying that they were helpful. Um, I mean, there is a, I, I have a close friend and she appears to be someone that has been set up to be my purpose to try to help her get through this big lifetime. Um, and I had visions of different past lives with which we had shared, but a very limited view. Um, I, I think I've mentioned it on the board, and um, or at least I've mentioned it to some people. The only real premonition that I could say that I've had is before uh, the morning of 911. And lots of people had similar things, or maybe not similar, but I mean premonitions of that. Um, I just started having these strange dreams. Basically, I would, I, for no for no explained reason, I had parked my truck in front of a building that I knew. It was nighttime. And as I was walking back to my truck, um, the shadows of the plantings around the building sort of, you know, like started rising up and turning into something on the nature of uh, Doberman pincers. 
and started towards me and I was quick. Uh, I was, uh, I carried a pistol in my truck so I was trying to get the door open and get to it but before I could get to it the dog, uh, the first dog got to me and I threw up my arm which knocked its head up and managed to pull out my knife and stab it in, you know, up through the belly into its heart. And this message came to me that the, the forces of evil are coming out into the light. I went back to sleep and did not sleep well, but I finally went back to sleep. And I was living with my mother at that time, taking care of her and my father. And uh, she said, come and see what's on television. And the first plane had already crashed. Now I can't say that it did me any good. It, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what the warning was about. I couldn't translate it into calling somebody and say their plane's being hijacked, but a lot of people had some kind of imagery like that. Or, you know, they knew something was going on. There was a disturbance in the force. That's happened to me, seeing things, but what to do with it? What to, how to interpret it? to actually apply it to something else, but that is the, uh, that's the um, difficult part, is what do you do with it. Perhaps nothing, perhaps you're not supposed to do anything with it, well, but simply I, understand that you're receiving a message. Yeah, well that's what people try to do out of body, McMonagall with, um, with um, uh, distance viewing, that kind of thing. They, they would like to do something like that. Um, there have been movies about it, but nobody's actually doing it. Um, you, you can't get that clear, you know, that the, the scion certainty principle steps in and says, you know, you can't only know but so much. You're not here to make things go the right way. You're here to deal with things as they are. You're here to interact with everybody else in the best way. Not that you're here to make sure that the school bus does not wreck and the plane does not crash and so forth. You might occasionally get that. Regarding premonitions, tell us about PMH Atwater. Well, she's written books and she writes about people knowing things in advance, experiencing things in advance. And she had wrote about a woman who dreamed that her husband was going to have a wreck going to some business meeting that he went to or whatever at night in some nearby town. So she wouldn't let him drive. She insisted on going with him and driving and they didn't have a wreck. And the next week when he had to go, she drove, and they didn't have a wreck. And she kept this up, but one time, and they, you know, it's, it looks like it's not gonna happen, she couldn't go. And he did, in fact, have a wreck, but he was not killed like she originally dreamed. But this, you know, Things take time for the probabilities to be changed. It, you, you have to expend energy in a sense. Uh, you have to exercise your intent long enough to make a real change. And speaking of exercising intent, this, um, the use of an, and direction of intent um, is everything. It can be applied to everything, and I know that you have done that with healing. Um, can you explain 
or describe to us some of the things that you have used uh, your intent for in that way? I wouldn't claim to be any kind of real healer. Okay. I've, I have supposedly helped, um, well, for instance, uh, Betty's son, Arthur. Um, she thinks that he does react to me when I'm do it, trying to do something and she says that he has gotten better. But there are other times when I've tried and I just couldn't seem to make contact with him. He was too agitated or I wasn't good enough about it. Um, I mean, people have done things for me um, and, you know, I could I could detect that, you know, something had improved. Uh, Montana on the bulletin board, he um, tried uh, early when I was, I was having um, uh, heart block, um, where the channels, uh, the communi the channels that control the beating of your heart were not well, two out of three were not working, according to the doctor. And um, Montana said, you have this black patch on your heart. Well, I thought that was a little kind of freaky, so I called the master and said, Tom, would you take a moment and see if what Montana says is right? And he said, well, I don't see it as black, it's sort of gray, and I don't see it as actually on your heart, as sort of over it, adjacent, you know, this kind of thing. And so I got kind of inspired, and I, I don't know whether I had a vague memory or what, or something whispered in my ear, but I looked up this ankylosing spondylitis website, and there is relatively rare, something like 1% of men with ankylosing spondylitis get this, where they get, um, it's not infection, it's um, inflammation. Inflammation is the word I was looking for. And it affects your aorta. It, it, it does exactly what the doctor described to me that, you know, this is what your problem is, there's a problem with the aorta, da 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 and it matched, and I, said, I came back to the cardiologist, and I said, you know, I kind of looked up, and I saw that this can be associated with ankylosing spondylitis, and it sounded just like what you described to me is that I had, and I, it came to me that if I took a bunch of vitamin C, anti, vitamin C is an anti-inflammatory, and I think it's helping because I don't get so easily tired. I don't run up against uh, lack of oxygen flow and therefore just can't create energy and keep moving. And so he d decided that Yes, we can drop this long operation that he was planning to input in a pacemaker. So, yeah, there are things you can do with it. Um, uh, and I, it's probably better to help each other than it is just to try to do it for yourself. Um, that was a collaborative effort between Montana and Tom and whoever whispered in my ear to look up some of this stuff, and it worked. Um, I can walk around with that. I mean, I still have problems walking because neural connections to my legs and things like that. But I don't just run out of gas because I can't pump enough blood and therefore oxygenate my body. You have called... Um Tom uses a lot of acronyms um, in his My Big Toe, and you have uh, one of your own, VRRE. Could you tell us something about how that came about? Well, Tom had used the generalization of the big computer, and I'm not saying that it's anything but the big computer, 
but it was a way to envision how it would do that part of it because while it's doing the basic generation and projection ahead cycle by cycle by cycle of the reality it's um, it's doing that by probability it isn't going to be moving your hand in your visual field or moving the other person or having the wind blow the bushes around based on probability entirely it's it's got to say move 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 and because of my work that i've done a lot of in latter years of uh, CAD or computer-aided design or drafting, I knew about rendering engines. I mean, that, that's what they're technically called. And it occurred to me that it would be a good idea to add some extension explanation to just saying the big computer did it in terms of saying exactly how the big computer does it in terms of fitting in with fractals and so on and so forth. And it makes, it makes good sense in terms of, you know, it's something we don't have to calculate if you can't, commun if you can't view that fractal, if you can't observe it. Or let's say if the only way you can observe it is lights in the sky as opposed to being all of these stars and galaxies and on and on and on. Why create a space, an artificial space in which you populate it with all these stars and galaxies and so forth when all you can see is lights up in the sky? And uh, the same goes on the other scale of things. If all you can see is a dirty pond of water, why generate for you all of these details which you can't see. And so I wrote up a chapter about that, um, looking at, well, just things in general, you know. If you've, if you've seen it, I, you know, I'm, I just, you know, I, I talk about Heidi and her goats on the mountain. Uh, you know, you can see what you can see and what's underneath the grass you can't see. It doesn't have to be generated. It doesn't have to be rendered. You get the shape. You get the shape of the mountain. And when you look across at the far mountain, you're going to see this green blur of vegetation. Because that's all you can see. Why generate it in detail? Now, if you get a world full of people and there's always somebody around got to see everything, well, that's still not true. I mean, people do go to bed at night and go to sleep, and the people who are out are in the dark, and they still can't see everything. But anyway, it, it, I, I kind of detail a lot of how some of these things would work, including why do you get the anomalies of quantum mechanics? And Tom kind of got interested in it. He says he doesn't remember that he particularly asked me, but I was finishing up, polishing, spell checking, uh, making changes, and having trouble getting it onto my website and all that kind of stuff, having to set up a way to generate a PDF file and he was getting tired of waiting he wanted to put it on the board and I got this message um, you know through consciousness space get this finished <laughs> or that's how I interpreted <laughs> it so I hurried and you know I sent him an email and said I'm working as fast as I can I'll get it finished because he wanted to get it up there because it it covered, he, he knew that he had quantum mechanics explained, but he still needed some imagery that he had not quite put together, and I gave him that imagery. 
That's fascinating. I know you went into a little bit of detail that did bring in the quantum mechanics. And I'm sure this is why you have called Tom's uh, My Big Toe the most advanced concept of modern physics. And this, I, I think you've discovered just why it is. As you've said before, everything fits into it. Your natural gifts, you, how, how have you had these gifts um, all of your life as a child? Um, well, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it was because I might be Asperger's mm -hmm. or whether it's the mysticism or what, but I have been the odd one out all along. I mean, I remember things, odds and ends, like I remember being sitting there in church listening to the preacher and he starts down one sentence and he doesn't complete it and he starts down another one and he starts down another one and I, I literally four sentences, four thoughts that he never completed and I remember saying something to my parents and afterward thing and they didn't have any idea that you know they didn't notice a thing um, and my concept of, um, oh, you know, the kind of stupid questions they ask in uh, Sunday school about how can God allow suffering to happen if God is all good and this kind of thing. And I never had that kind of concept of God. I mean, it was not this simplistic Sunday school thing. God was, we were part of God. Uh, I always thought I knew that, or at least I thought that, and um, it didn't necessarily match what, this, what they were saying in church. Um, so, you know, it's, it's gone on all my life. Um, I've been attracted to Zen Buddhism. Um, uh, I, 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 va I remember reading it. I was permitted to go into the, into the adult library. You know, not, I wasn't stuck in just the children's library. And I remember reading... Autobiography of Autobiography Yogi. Autobiography of a Yoga. Yeah. yeah. Can't remember who wrote it. But that was uh, Yogananda. Mm -hmm. But I remember that I read that. And I remember that I was maybe, I don't know, I don't know whether it was fourth grade, fifth grade, or what. You had always had a path where, you know, what things came into your path along the way before you had come up to my big toe. So it's interesting, this I read Autobiography of a Yogi back in the 70s. Um, and from there on, read different books that always hinted at the big picture that only Tom, until he, until My Big Toe came out, only Tom managed to collaborate the whole big picture or put the whole big picture together. Everything then made sense to me. Yeah. I don't know how, you, I'm sure you feel the same way. About yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Tom is, Tom, in reality, is not saying anything that the Buddha didn't say. And they, they talked about the um, Indra's net uh, back in ancient history, Hindu metaphysics. Indra's net is the VRRE with the IUOCs on it, right there, total, word for word, precisely the same thing. It's just in different metaphors, totally different metaphors. When the Buddha said, this world is illusion, what's he talking about but a virtual reality yes. when they didn't have the science to talk about virtual realities? And they, people have been contacting NPMR, as far back as we have records of anything, I mean, 
that's what shamans do. And they've had shamans since we were crawling around in the bushes eating grubs. Uh, it, it, it's, that's just the way the reality is and has been. And it, it came to be sort of rejected when they started having all of the uh, science success and so forth. And uh, you, know, you start doing math and you start calculating the paths of projectiles and you develop armies and navies and agriculture and telescopes and so forth. And they start figuring like they really understand things. Tom has mentioned about how he, this is a project. It's not just, he was intended to do what he did. He could have failed. I think I'm intended to be doing what I'm doing to help him. I could have failed. Maybe we would have provided some kind of backup if one of us had failed and the other would have handled it all. But um, I think I'm supposed to be here to help him. He's the explorer. I, I'm just the indication that you don't have to do it by exploration. Out-of-body exploration is not everything, uh, and you can still contact the greater reality and get information as you need it without doing it consciously. We are not conscious of what goes on within our beings. If we were conscious of it all, we couldn't function. It has to be skimmed off the top. And what we need to know, what needs to be conscious, is made conscious. Now, it doesn't always work right. Some people get obsessive, obsessive compulsive, and they, they think round and round and round about the same thing. Well, that's going round and round and round in your digital reality but it gets shunted aside and the decisions get made on other bases. And you don't need to hear all of that chatter. There have been people, um, uh, Suzanne Siegel, uh, she wrote a book about how she was, um, she had fooled around with transcendental, med transcendental meditation knew something about it. She was pregnant. She was on the way to visit her, her doctor. She was stepping up on the bus and a switch got turned. And all of a sudden, she had no more thoughts in her head. She would say things and do things and she didn't know why. I mean, she kept on with her life. Didn't miss a beat but it scared the hell out of her because all of a sudden she wasn't there anymore. And not only that, but her field of view, instead of coming, you know, appearing to be out of her eyes, was about uh, two feet behind her and a little to the left, seeing the back of her head in her field of view, which kind of freaked her out. Well, I, I know somebody who periodically experiences something like this. Her field of view changes and she can see herself in her field of view. And it doesn't freak her out, she just kind of lives with it. Um, and I've had where my, the stream of consciousness quit. Uh, and I had been deliberately working towards it and asking for it. Um, so I wasn't afraid of it. It didn't bother me, but it was kind of novel to, you know, you open your mouth and words are coming out and <laughs> you didn't know you were going to say that. Um, but, you know, didn't miss a beat. Got in the car, drove to work, didn't do planning, but I got there. And, you know, everything went the way it was supposed to go, and I interacted with the boss and fellow employees, and I did my work. There just wasn't any stream of consciousness, you know. There wasn't any string of thinking, words passing through. 
now it's sort of, it's pretty much, it's not back like it was, but I mean, I can sort of switch back and forth and I don't really worry about it anymore. Um, you know, basically I realize that I, I think that that's a function of the rendering engine as to, you know, what is supposed to come into your consciousness. The reality is clicking along at this, you know, I, I can't remember Tom's numbers, but I mean, it's, you know, Planck's constant and the, the shortest increment of time that it can exist and all of that, that's how fast things are clicking along. We don't think that fast. So what comes into our minds is, is what is supposed to come there. As long as the machine doesn't screw up, I say machine, I mean, you know. And, and there are glitches. People, people are, people who are, are obsessive compulsive, and they think over and over and over and over and over and over and over about the same thing. And it's not supposed to be that way, but it happens. Now, whether that's part of the PMR rule set or whether it's a glitch, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but basically you can understand all of these things if you really understand Tom's model. It all falls right out. You don't have to think that these psi things are, un are mysterious and, you know, it it's all makes perfectly good, simple, ordinary sense. Our, our reality is our reality. And our reality is not objective, it's subjective. It is digital in consciousness. And it is not, uh, you know, forces and energies and so on and so forth as, the, as physics talks about material reality. That's just the way it is. Now, that doesn't say that it's not a very good way to do math and science in this reality and knowing this, understanding it is not, it's not for the purpose of saying, well, I don't have to do this anymore. You know, I'm beyond that, I've graduated, I understand. No, that has nothing to do with it. People who have, I don't think we really ever graduate we're going to continue to come back. It's just that we start being more of help to other people. You know, it, it, uh, we, we serve others, but we still serve the consciousness system by both lowering our entropy very, entropy very slightly and helping to lower the entropy of others by what we, can, what we can teach them and what we can help them to deal with in their lives. I think you've said it perfectly and I think you are a wonderful help and have been a wonderful help to Tom and will continue to be and also to Tom's forum. And I know they appreciate you very much and I appreciate your interview today. Thank you very much, Ted. Well, thank you.